I am Dr. Bandy Lee, forensic and social psychiatrist, president of the World Mental Health Coalition, and convener of the 2017 Yale conference that led to the New York Times bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess the president. My colleagues and I came forward in unprecedented ways because of the unprecedented dangers we saw and the critical need for our expertise. But we were also shut down in unprecedented ways because like in all authoritarian times, truth, which empowers the public, became a threat. So amid this silencing, the dangers could only spread as illustrated in my recent book, The Psychology of Trump Contagion, an existential threat to American democracy and all humankind. Now, we are trying to rectify this vacuum of the most relevant expertise through a new book and a major all-day conference at the National Press Club. In 2016, while I was researching genocides, gender-based violence, civil wars, and rising suicides in low- and middle-income countries, the last thing on my mind was American partisan politics. Then, the issue exploded and invaded my world the morning after Donald Trump's election, starting at 8 a.m., when my phone was ringing off the hook and emails were flooding in, mostly from civil society members that I came to know after my expert report in the, on the infamous Rikers Island jail complex in New York City put me on the front page of the New York Times. They were desperately reaching out to me because they perceived correctly that violence was to come with Trump's presidency, and they were reaching out because I was a violence expert. It was then that I decided that I no longer had the option to opt out when my country needed me the most and the people were calling on experts to validate and explain what they were seeing. Besides, I had devoted my career to studying, predicting, and preventing violence, so why would I turn away in the face of potentially civilization-ending violence? Around that time, a former colleague from Harvard, Dr. Judith Herman, had written to President Barack Obama asking that the president-elect undergo a neuropsychiatric evaluation. I was delighted to find this out, and so I reconnected with Dr. Herman after more than 12 years. And I started composing letters of myself, but those, uh, but uh, com composing similar letters to Congress at that time, but those around me, while unanimously agreeing that the situation was dangerous, would not put their names to these letters. A number of them admitted they were fearful of a litigious president's retaliation, asked if I were not afraid, and advised that I seek legal counsel even that early on. So it is quite obvious how early and how precisely mental health experts were detecting the vi violence. And, um, but uh, the professionals would voluntarily censor themselves. And, uh, and I was not in agreement with this because obeying in advance is, is exactly what makes a dictator and creates a much more dangerous situation for all of us. So as, I, as psychiatrists, we had a medical consensus and all agreed, but as to what to do about it, I di diverged from my colleagues. That is how I came to organize my 2017 conference at Yale School of Medicine. It was just after the American Psychiatric Association, less than two months into the Trump administration, had just pulled out the obscure guideline called the Goldwater Rule and modified it into a universal gag order, which it was never meant to be. Although the larger society barely noticed, this was, in my view, the first sign of authoritarianism, an act intended to silence the experts who are the most critically important to the situation. I titled my conference as does professional responsibility include a duty to warn? 
To answer this question, I invited some of the best minds in my field, each of whom I had known for at least 15 years and had followed their exemplary ethical stances. These included Dr. Judith Herman, uh, author of Trauma and Recovery, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, author of Nazi Doctors, Dr. James Gilgan, author of Violence, as well as a colleague from my division at Yale who happened to be on the APA's Ethics Committee. By collecting our voices, I hope to help dispel this fear and to galvanize our sense of ethical obligation. At that time, a few Connecticut news sources reported on our meeting, which soon received national and international attention, eventually receiving news coverage in, in at least 50 different countries on five continents. Le Monde, Die Welt, Haaretz, Al Jazeera and USA Today were all reporting on us and interviewed me. And members of the US Congress also began contacting me at that time, starting with a representative from Connecticut, but expanding to over 50 members, as I mentioned, uh, influential uh, former majority and minority house leader was also involved uh, and also a respected past presidential candidate. Thousands of mental health professionals from all over the country, as well as from around the world, reached out to me, stating that there needed to be a professional association addressing societal responsibility. Now, since the APA abdicated its role, but instead was hindering independent professionals who would wish to speak up, for which it obtained windfalls of federal funding and a building in the center of Washington, D.C., uh, this was when we decided to co-found the National Coalition of Concerned Mental Health Experts, which became, became the World Mental Health Coalition after international members joined. So immediately after the conference, um, all of this was galvanizing. The editor of Macmillan contacted me uh, as a publisher, and I was putting together the proceedings of the conference into a public service book. Dr. J. Lifton's forward and Dr. Judith Herman's and my prologue started the volume and Dr. James Gilligan elucidated that the ethical duty to warn potential victims um, is, is a primary obligation that does not involve whether a person is mentally ill, but whether someone is dangerous, which is what we were saying about Donald Trump. So when, when our book was released later that year, it became an instant New York Times bestseller, unprecedented for a multi-authored book of specialized knowledge, I was told. And the book was The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess the President. Macmillan, one of the big five publishers in the United States, took five weeks of repeat printings to catch up with the demand. We heard stories of people driving across states to get to the one remaining copy in the bookstore. The public's thirst for the special information we had was palpable. And to remove any conflicts of interest, we donated all revenues to the public good. Our message was mainly that Donald Trump's condition was more serious than people assumed, that it would grow worse with actual power, and that he would eventually become uncontainable. By the end, it was on the bestseller, bestseller list for seven weeks, and the Washington Post dubbed it the most courageous book of the year. Within three months of publication, we were the number one topic of national conversation. I was on the front page of the New York Times again, and I was invited to write opinion articles for The Guardian, Politico, The Independent, The Boston Globe, and The New York Daily News. I invited co-authors whenever I could to show that we were multiple and every article, including my letter to the editor to the New York Times, would all become the most read of that day, that week, or that weekend. Not only did my book contain contributions from said to be the greatest living thinkers of the field of mental health, according to one reporter, uh, at least a dozen chairs of psychiatry from around the country reached out to me with compliments and relief. One of them, former chair of psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco, even stated publicly 
When I first heard about the conference that gave rise to this book at Yale, I was worried that a manifesto would come out with a diagnosis. That is not what happened. What happened is a very thoughtful assessment based on lots of public data, which gives us a very clear way of thinking about the terrific vulnerabilities of our current president or President Trump at that time and elicits a duty to warn. Among other prominent psychiatrists who agreed with us and supported us was Dr. Steve Sharfstein, a renowned former president of the APA, actually, who helped the APA avoid a scandal when he took a firm ethical stance against the Bush administration's pressures to support their torture program, which the American Psychological Association did and then was later scandalized. The collective support of our endeavor did not end with our colleagues. One of the most respected senior journalists of our time, Bill Moyers, said of our work, there will not be a book published this fall more urgent, important, or controversial than the dangerous case of Donald Trump. Political commentators agreed. Uh, host of The Last Word, Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC introduced our book on a show as The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, an historic work in the history of American psychiatry. We have never been in this place before. And as you know, since he has often mentioned our work and um, has often highlighted uh, the same issues that we try to highlight. So we continue to receive considerable recognition and involvement by some of the most distinguished and well-known academic leaders. Um, including ethicists, doctors Jerome Kroll and Claire Pouncey, who agreed that our interpretation of the Goldwater Rule was correct and that, um, that it was set up as an etiquette toward public figures, but our duty to the public, even, uh, if, even if we didn't reach a situation of danger, but just to promote its well-being, that, uh, that we could comment on public figures and, and rather should. So at this time, various members of the U.S. Congress had been reaching out to me uh, since the conference at Yale School of Medicine. I consulted with them privately over the phone, and then they invited me to Washington, D.C. I asked Dr. James Gilgan, a foremost violence expert and my mentor, to join me. And upon arrival, we found that the lawmakers were eager beyond expectation. One senator even said that it was his most awaited meeting in 11 years. I would ultimately meet with over 50 Congress members over a period of five months, and they considered ways of invoking the 25th Amendment through the other body as Congress is permitted to do, and as the amendment provides. Uh, other talks included impeachment at that time. So there were multiple avenues and multiple ways in which uh, dealing with this situation was considered. Overall, I was impressed that our country had such seemingly capable, concerned, and intelligent leaders as those I met, because they, uh, I, I met up with a whole host of Congress members, not just those who appear in the media. So I was immensely humbled when one of them even called me his hero. The most surprising part was that they were looking to us. They conveyed that if we continued to educate the public medically as we had been, then they would be able to intervene politically. In other words, they were willing to listen to expertise and to react according to our assessment of the situation. Interviews and news coverage were building up in this context, and to my great surprise, there did not seem to be any inhibitions about asking mental health experts to comment on mental health issues, and I considered that the nation had greatly progressed, and the decades of mental health awareness campaigns, especially uh, escalating and um, accelerating during the Obama years, seemed to have borne fruit. Both lawmakers and journalists told us that we were very close to a tipping point where our education of the, of the public might indeed make a difference. We know what happened after that. The American Psychiatric Association and the New York Times shut us down almost immediately as soon as we were great gaining national attention and traction. 
And we were shut down in ways that all the major media took took the cue from the New York Times that uh, we were not people to air or to have on and that the only people not allowed to speak about mental health were mental health experts themselves, which is, if you think about it, a ludicrous idea. But these kinds of things happen in times of authoritarianism and the early people who warned of it and could have stopped it were exactly the people who were stopped. This is why we are once again organizing a major all day dangerous case of Donald Trump conference in Washington, DC. At this extremely critical time, more than ever before in our lifetime, about a month before the election. So this coming September, a little more than a month before the election, we feel we have uh, another golden opportunity. The groundbreaking Harris Walls campaign has actually opened a window of opportunity for us to be able to not only face the dangerous perils that have been leading up to this point, but to bring appropriate expertise back into the conversation so that we can really, truly, once again, have a rational discussion. How did we come to allow an unfit person into the office of the US presidency? And how was he allowed to run for the top government position again after attempting to overturn the government? And how can we deal with the unfit candidates in the future? We don't have a mechanism for that. And uh, how can we hear from the appropriate experts when the time comes, when there is a need, as uh, we ought to and thought, as a matter of fact, we would? Uh, how could we prevent another eight, nine, or 10 years as we have suffered uh, that could all have been prevented if those who were um, accustomed to these to dealing with individuals such as Donald Trump were allowed to speak up and allowed to have a role, uh, have influence in, um, uh, in at the national level when the problem got to that level. And what can we do about the world order, uh, the world order that Donald Trump has upended, which is often not talked about uh, but psychologically, he has done a great deal to sever our alliances, to destabilize the globe, and to embolden psychologically dangerous dictators. And these are among the things, the psychological, social, cultural, geopolitical dangers that we predicted and warned against for having such a dangerous individual in such a powerful office. And that is why the year before the 2020 election, we organized a major conference at the National Press Club in Washington, DC, the dangerous state of the world and the need for fit leadership. The conference was considered important enough that it was broadcast for all three hours on C-SPAN. And never before or since have we brought together 13 highly respected experts from all different fields, including psychiatry, political science, economics, philosophy, fascism, politics, journalism, climate science, and nuclear weapons. At this even more critical time, when there's a potential for us to have an even greater impact before the next election, we need to make this a significant live event in Washington, as well as online throughout the country in September. To do so, we will need to get professionals to work with us to prepare it, widely publicize it, broadcast it live, as well as get C-SPAN once again to cover it. This needs to be a major and newsworthy event, including having members of Congress, and major media attending it and covering it. The single theme of the conference will be that Donald Trump absolutely must be kept from returning to the Oval Office and that the three criminal trials, the January 6th insurrection in DC, classified documents in Florida and election interference in Georgia must all proceed. To make this a major talked about event, 
This all day conference will open at nine in the morning with intense presentation from all the participants. That opening session will be followed by buffet lunch and then will be a multi-hour afternoon question and answer session with all the mental health expert authors who can make it and with all major media members of Congress and uh, whoever else uh, will be able to attend and all will be invited. Um, so we need to have a publicity campaign with our uh, blackout with the media, which has continued even to the last minute of the most perilous uh, time in our history. Uh, we will have to let millions know about it and be able to watch it, um, uh, to watch key excerpts from it, and will uh, which will quickly edit and place online. And immediately after the conference, we will need to have a team of professional video editors to put together an hour summary of the key segments, including key, key questions asked at the conference, along with selection of short clips, all ready to quickly put online and circulate in, with the major media for use within a day or two of the conference. This conference will only be worth doing if we can reach a vast audience of millions at this key point in time, with many persons filling the ballroom at the National Press Club, many watching live, and many more in subsequent days watching online. The conference will only be worth doing and have the kind of influence we wish to have if done in this major way and become widely known. So we have very limited, limited time now to get everything in motion and to make this happen. It can happen if we can quickly raise the funds that are needed. We had a generous individual donor who got us started and uh, got us moving with this idea in the first place. Um, and a gracious volunteer has created a GoFundMe campaign, uh, which I will add to uh, the link later and uh, under the description of this video, which I hope you will uh, contribute to because we're really relying on you, uh, the public who have called on us to speak up from the very beginning. Now for today, the questions we may need to answer might include, how will Donald Trump cope? with someone rising beyond him in popularity? What will happen in these key months leading up to the election? What kind of uh, tricks and major events will he try to orchestrate or those helping him uh, try to, which is very much a possibility? What will, he, what will happen if he loses the election again this time? now that he has institutionalized election denial and has uh, so many oligarchs and even the Supreme Court on his side. So just because uh, our preferred candidate's campaign has now taken off uh, successfully in ways that are beyond expectation, the dangers in some ways have increased even more. And so we need to continue to speak about this and to alert the public and those who are capable of intervening to, to prepare for it in ways that we must as never before in history.